Hi, my name is Caleb Doherty, and I'm an R&D engineer on the Keysight Pathwave 89600 VSA team. I'd like to introduce you to our channel sounding solution, why you might want to use it, how it works, and what results you can measure. Here we have a channel sounding measurement at 144 GHz. On the right, you can see the time and frequency domain plots of the channel response. The frequency response is the blue trace in the upper right, and the time domain response is in the red trace below it. The red trace shows the reflections of the impulse sent into the channel. The peak is placed in the middle of the trace at time equals zero. In this particular measurement, there are two main peaks and several other smaller peaks. Then there is a lower level of power underneath all distinguishable peaks. This power tapers off into the noise floor as you get out further into time. Later, I'll explain this scenario in more detail, but first let's get a high-level view. The basics. Channel sounding is the process of measuring the response of a channel to an impulse. When you know this information, assuming your channel is linear and time invariant, you can exactly predict what the response will be to any signal you put into the channel at any time in the future. This is because the signal can be expressed as a linear combination of impulses. You simply compute the channel's response to each impulse in your signal, and then add the responses together to get the total response to your signal, a process also known as convolution. Note that a channel can be anything in between the output of the sounding signal and the input to the analysis hardware. In a nutshell, the channel sounding procedure is 1. Send a known signal into the channel. 2. Capture the signal after the channel, and 3. Compute the channel response by comparing the sent signal with the received signal. Let's take a look at one particular channel in a top-down view. This channel is a free space environment that contains several reflective objects. If we send a signal into this environment using an antenna, in this case using Keysight's custom modulation signal studio software, uh, connected to a signal generator, the signal will disperse and reflect off the objects in the channel. The power that makes it to the receive antenna can then be captured by the acquisition hardware and analyzed by the channel sounding software in the Pathwave 89600 VSA software. Okay, let's stop a minute and ask why. Why do people need to measure channels? One common use case is a network measurement. Although a network analyzer might be more appropriate here, you can measure the S21's frequency response of a two-port device with channel sounding. Another use case is end-to-end -end calibration. You have a signal generator and are going to test the EVM of a device with a particular modulation. But you want to remove the effects of the test fixture from the measurement results. Lastly, an area of research that is active during the creation of this video is 6G research into higher frequency bands. Sub-terahertz frequency bands, those that are 100 to 300 gigahertz, are of interest for 6G research because wide modulation bandwidths could potentially be used to achieve data throughput exceeding 100 gigabits per second. However, these frequency bands are relatively new and uncharacterized, so channel sounding may be needed as part of early 6G research. For example, what does the channel look like when you transmit inside a building? Or what is the difference between wood and concrete buildings? These are the kind of questions that can be answered by channel sounding. Now, some particular features of the Signal Studio and 89600 VSA channel sounding solution are a support for a variety of transmit and receive hardware, multiple receive channels. So for instance, you can simultaneously measure the receive signal from different directions, low SNR support through signal averaging, and lastly, no need for any cables between transmitter and receive hardware, making it easy to position them at various locations in the channel, potentially very far apart. Now let's get back to the example I showed you at the beginning of the video. Here is our channel. We have two reflectors in an RF chamber. The reflectors are made of boards covered with aluminum foil and mounted on tripods. Then we have our transmitter and receiver on a table at the back of the chamber. 
Here's the top-down view. The black rectangle represents the table, and the orange boxes represent the instruments on the table. There are two signal converters, each with a horn antenna, and I'll show you a close-up in a minute. The two reflectors are placed at roughly 1 meter and 2 meters away from the transmit and receive antennas. When the sounding signal is transmitted, the receive antenna will see two main reflections of the transmitted signal separated in time. Okay, here's the close-up of Keysight's new sub-terahertz testbed for 6G research. This testbed has also been demonstrated in measuring EVM at D-band, which is 110 to 170 gigahertz, and G-band, which is 140 to 220 gigahertz, which you can find more info about at www.keysight.com slash find slash 6G. But here we are using the same hardware setup to perform channel sounding. On the left, we have the 89600 VSA software and Signal Studio software running in a controller PC card in the AXIE chassis. The Signal Studio software sends the signal to the M8195AWG, which is also in the AXIE chassis, and the 89600 VSA software captures the data from the UXR oscilloscope on the right side of the table. The 89600 VSA software could easily be run on the oscilloscope, or even on another computer on the network. The signal from the M8195A AWG is transmitted at a symbol rate of 4 gigasymbols per second and a center of 6 gigahertz. This signal is upconverted by the VDI converter to a center of 144 gigahertz and transmitted using a horn antenna with a nominal beam width of 9 or 10 degrees. The PSG behind the converters provides a, a local oscillator signal for both converters through a splitter. The LO could have been provided by separate instruments, but since the transmitter and receiver were co-located, we connected it this way for convenience. Then the down converter shifts the signal back down to 6 GHz, and the signal is captured by the oscilloscope. Let's walk through the procedure. So here I have the N7608C custom modulation version of Signal Studio. It can create many types of signals, but here I'm going to select channel sounding from the shortcut by modulation menu. Normally the first step would be to connect to your signal generator. Since I've already captured a recording of the channel sounding signal in the RF chamber, I've just selected a simulated M8195 for now. OK, now that we've selected the channel sounding signal, we can configure the parameters. I chose a sequence length of 512 symbols and a symbol rate of 4 gigasymbols per second. I left the filter and multipath parameters at the defaults. Once you finish configuring these parameters, you can click the download button and that will generate the sounding waveform and send it to the AWG for playback. Now let's switch to the 89600 VSA software. To configure the VSA for channel sounding, the first thing would be to connect to your measurement hardware. But in this case, I've already loaded the recording of the sounding signal into the VSA. This particular waveform was captured at a center frequency of 6 GHz after down conversion from 144 GHz. I configured the user correction properties of the VSA so that the user interface correctly reflects the 144 GHz signal center before down conversion. The next step would be to set your measurement span, which in this case is 4 GHz. Typically you would just set the span the same as your sounding symbol rate. Now we need to configure the channel sounding measurement. First I'll go ahead and select the channel sounding measurement extension. and the parameters for configuring the measurement are located on the channel sounding properties dialog. The only two parameters I need to configure here are the sequence length and symbol rate. Since we are using matched RRC filtering, the filter parameters need to match Signal Studio. Otherwise, you can configure the filter parameters according to your needs. 
For example, to reduce the effect of side lobes, you might select a Gaussian filter. OK, now that that's set up, let's run the measurement. On the left side, we can see the basic spectrum and some signal metrics. The spectrum is useful to verify that your signal is present, and the metrics can give you a sense of whether there are any impairments that might affect the measurement of the channel. On the right side, we have the frequency and time domain versions of the channel response. The trace that is of most interest for this example is the impulse response. This trace shows the various reflections in the channel. This includes their location and time, their amplitude, and if you were to select a different trace format, their phase relative to the measurement carrier. If the channel was a purely flat channel, you would see only one path. Depending on the physical arrangement of transmitter and receiver, you can interpret the paths that you see in the impulse response. If the transmitter and receiver were on either end of the room, you could interpret the highest path, which incidentally is always placed in the center of the impulse response, as the direct line of sight path and the other paths as reflections off the walls of the room. In our example, though, both the transmitter and receiver are located in the same plane and are pointed at objects in the room. The highest path in an impulse response may not be the first reflector, depending on how absorptive the reflector is relative to the others. But in this case, both reflectors are made of the same material, so the amplitude difference that you can see between the two main peaks uh, can probably be attributed to free space loss or to slight beam misalignment. Anyways, in this impulse response, we can interpret the first peak as the closer reflector and the second peak as the second reflector. Electromagnetic waves travel approximately 300 millimeters per second in air. Inverting this value gives us 3.33 nanoseconds per meter traveled. Since the path difference between the two reflectors is 2 meters, we should see approximately 6.7 nanoseconds between the paths. Let's make a rough measurement by using delta markers. I'm going to go ahead and close the frequency response for now. First, we place a marker on the peak. Then select zero delta, so we get a second fixed marker at the same location. Then I can move the first marker to the second peak. We can see that the time difference is about 7 nanoseconds, which is close to the 6.7 nanosecond value that we just calculated. The other smaller peaks are probably reflections off the instruments and walls of the room. As the signal continues bouncing around the room, the power decreases and you can see a gradual decay of the power over time. OK, another thing. If we look at the main peak, we can see that it is about 45 dB above the noise floor. Can we do better? Some of the noise can be assumed to be Gaussian and as such uncorrelated across time. This means we can average multiple channel response measurements and the uncorrelated part of the noise if we do vector averaging, we'll average towards zero. There are two ways to do this in the channel sounding measurement. One is to increase the number of repeats parameter. This will acquire a longer time record and average the repetitions of the impulse response together. This method of averaging is useful to dig the signal out of the noise when the measurement is having trouble synchronizing. However, the measurement will update slower and be more sensitive to symbol clock error. The alternative is to enable VSA measurement averaging, which you can do by selecting RMS video averaging in the Mesh Setup Average dialog. I'll select the exponential version so the average keeps being updated after the count has been reached. Note that this parameter serves a dual purpose. It enables measurement averaging and also specifies the default average type. The measurement can choose a different averaging method if RMS is not appropriate. For example, the yellow spectrum trace on the left is RMS averaged, but the frequency and impulse responses are vector averaged. In both cases, averaging is performed point by point, but in the case of vector averaging, the complex values are averaged instead of the squared magnitude. Note that the time alignment the measurement performs before averaging is done without the need of a hardware trigger. There's enough time data in this recording for about 500 averages. 
Perhaps you didn't notice, but the noise floor decreases quickly at first and then slows down. We'll go ahead and restart the average so that you can see that. Eventually you'll reach a limit. This is due in part to the residual frequency and symbol clock errors in the measurement, which prevent the sounding signal from modeling an ideal impulse and instead being an impulse with some very low amplitude side lobes. However, we can see that now the noise floor is about 70 dB below the main peak, an improvement of 25 dB. One last thing to mention is that the channel sounding solution supports multiple received channels. This allows you to measure the relative differences between channel responses. This could be antennas with different polarizations or antennas pointed in different directions or some other scenario. So, thanks for watching this video, and before you go, here are some links to find more information about Keysight's products and solutions. Also, you may be interested in the flex frame measurement provided by the 89600 VSA. Instead of being a standards-based modulation analysis tool, it allows you to define and analyze your own custom frame. This could be helpful in your 6G research as you prototype different ideas for the next standard.